Welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Home Valley. We're delighted that you can join us this Father's Day. It's Father's Day in the UK, so happy Father's Day. And tonight, I'm praying that we're going to have a fresh revelation, a revelation of God's goodness towards us. Amen? Amen. What we need is revelation, revelation, revelation. We want God's Word to come alive in our hearts that inspires our faith. And as faith arises, God moves in a powerful way. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we open our hearts to you right now. Father, yes, Lord, we, Father, open our hearts to you and say, Holy Spirit, show us more of Jesus tonight. Show us more of your love tonight. May we have revelation after revelation. May we see scriptures in a new light. May we, may we hear your word and may the penny drop. And may faith arise, and as faith arises, Lord Jesus, and we pray, Father, may you move into action, and may we see victory after victory, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Argyle. Good evening. I'll read the scripture in a moment, all right? But um, first, I just want to say, we don't live in a perfect world. And because of that, we will face trouble or difficulties in our lives, not always of our own making. Indeed, Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation. So how do we face each day without allowing fear to creep in and steal our peace and joy and short circuit our faith? We need to set our focus back on God and his word, his truth. We need to ask the Holy Spirit for a specific scripture to stand on. This week, the Holy Spirit brought this scripture to my mind when I was dealing with a certain situation. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God, boundless, indestructible, imperishable, is your refuge, your fortress, your stronghold, your security, your haven, your hideaway, your protection, your escape, your sanctuary, your retreat, and your shelter. And underneath, supporting you, keeping you, lifting you, strengthening you, your foundation are the everlasting arms, never failing, ever present, never ending, unchanging, permanent, eternal, constant, and life-giving. Hallelujah. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. What a wonderful scripture or verse to focus on that will lift you up through any tribulation. That's Deuteronomy 33, 27, if you want to look that up and meditate on it. Amen? Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of of your parenthood and your loving care. But now I am your son, I am adopted in your family and I can never be alone because Father God, you're there beside me. Those everlasting arms are underneath me. Hallelujah. Let's worship him.
Father, we thank you. We thank you that you never leave us. You never forsake us. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are welcome yes. into your presence. Yes. So close to you. You live within us by your Holy Spirit. You never reject us, never push us away. Your grace and your mercy are freely available. You surround us with your love and your everlasting arms are underneath us. They'll never give way. They'll never let us down. We are secure. We are protected in that place, that beautiful place of freedom and love. Hallelujah.
Creator King, the Lord of the heavens, the Lord of the earth, who is interested in me. Thank you that, Lord, that among the gods there is none like you, that you are great and you do marvellous deeds and you do marvellous deeds in our lives too. Thank you, Jesus. And we just open our, our hearts out to you right now to receive your goodness, your greatness, those things that are impossible to man, that are possible with you. We receive them right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Do take your seat if you haven't already done so. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So this is where we ended up last week. Um, don't be drunk with wine, in which, is in, dis is in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I tried to delineate or make a, uh, uh, define 
uh, what the difference was between a psalm, a hymn, and a spiritual song. And it's interesting in it, uh, 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 cafe groups this week that on both Tuesday and Thursday, it was brought up that a spiritual song, a very simple definition of a spiritual song, is a song from the Spirit. A song that the Spirit himself gives you. The, a song that bubbles up from within and just erupts in, in, in choruses of praise to our God. A spiritual song, a spiritual song that God, that the Holy Spirit might give you in, in, in English or in the uh, spiritual language, in tongues, that gives glory to him and honours his name. And also, uh, we looked at last week how um, uh, praising the Lord changes the spiritual climate. It is the thermostat that sets the spiritual climate. It's not a thermometer to, that reacts to what is happening in our lives, but praise sets the spiritual climate. When we praise, our focus is upon him. Uh, our focus is upon him and his word. We sing the truth of who God is. Faith is inspired. Faith is put into action in prayer. And in response to prayer, there is breakthrough. Hallelujah. God responds to faith. Uh, so often uh, we might think that que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, and what's the point of praying? But God, uh, what's, why bother praying? Because what will be, will be. But God responds to prayer. Things happen because you pray. Things happen because I pray in faith. And if we're struggling with our faith, let's start singing the praises of, God, of our God because as we listen uh, to those words that we are singing, faith is inspired. Another question that was asked at the, um, the, at the group on Tuesday night was uh, with reference to Paul and Silas. So you remember that Paul and Silas were in prison and that they had been chased down, by, chased down the road by the mob. They'd been beaten and they had been uh, um, whipped, thrown into prison, put into stocks and in the deepest cell in the place, uh, uh, in the prison, and they were singing their praises at midnight. And somebody asked the question, what would have happened if they hadn't have praised? Well, again, like I said a moment ago, that God responds to faith. So nothing would have happened if they hadn't have praised. What would have happened if they'd have half praised and sort of kept their eyes up for a minute and then went back down and sort of tossed to and fro? And I believe that the answer to that question is, is that the answer would not have come as, as quickly um, think about the, uh, is it Daniel 10, when uh, the angel turns up and says to Daniel, I have come in response to your prayer. I was dispatched on the day that you uh, said your prayer, but for 21 days I've been struggling, I've been having an encounter with the Prince of Persia, who has delayed me, the Prince of Persia being Satan. And there we have a picture of what was happening in the heavenlies, that, that the enemy was resisting the answer to Daniel's prayer. And last week we reminded ourselves, how do we weaken the enemy? What sends the enemy scarpering? Praise. He can't, he can't stand to hear the sound of praise. So as we continue to praise him, as we continue to, to honour him, as we continue to believe him and, uh, 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 and sing our praises in faith, the devil must flee. And, and doing that creates a climate for the angels just to get through very quickly and very speedily in answers to our prayers. Um, it's almost as if, I don't know whether I, uh, this is an appropriate uh, um, uh, illustration to use, but you remember Superman, and um, is it kryptonite that weakens Superman? You know, if, if you want to weaken su Superman, you just bring some kryptonite near him and it is no longer strong. Well, if you want to destroy the power of the enemy, sing some praises to him. Uh, sing some praises sing some If you want to weaken the power of the enemy, sing some praises to God. And it will weaken him. Thank you, Jesus. Now, that little Freudian slip might be appropriate just to stop there, you know, because <laughs> um, when you sing praises to the enemy, it does empower the enemy. Fear empowers the enemy. 
when we doubt, it empowers the enemy. When we go home and say, oh, it will never happen to me. This will never happen in my life. God never answers my prayers. What does that do? It empowers the enemy. But let us sing our praises to God. It reminds me also of that scripture in, um, is it all, I don't know, in the Old Testament. Aaron and her, um, Moses is up on the top of the mountain and the Amalekites are uh, in a battle against the Israelites. And Aaron and her hold up Moses' hands because when Moses' hands are raised, the Israelites um, uh, win. When they are put down by his side, uh, they start losing. So Aaron and her come one, one side on this and one side on the other and they hold his hands up high. It's a picture of intercession, praying, but also I think it's a picture of praise because Moses' hands are in, raised up in praise. When we praise, the enemy loses. God wins. There is breakthrough in our lives. I want to encourage you just to continue just to focus on Jesus. And if you're tempted to despair, start praising him and start listening to the words that you're singing and faith will arise. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Something else that came out of uh, um, uh, either one of the Tuesday or Thursday nights, I can't remember how it was we were praying about healing, talking about praying for people with healing and how often... Uh, when you're praying for somebody, you get a bit of pushback. And if you're, if you're wanting to practice praying for those people uh, who don't give pushback, it's often good to pray for babies because in babies, you, you, they've got no doubt. And I know a chap who actually says a good way to pray for, practice praying for, 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 thing, for people is to pray for, for animals because with animals, you can't get any pushback from the animals. So he said, pray for your cat. And uh, funny enough, I, I shared that on, on Tuesday night and, and Tess shared with me before the, the, the after, uh, before this evening's message that she'd prayed for a bird in her garden this afternoon. It had um, flown straight into a patio door window and was stunned and she went out and picked it up and started stroking its head and she prayed for it and it started hopping over the garden and, and flew off. So, you know, <laughs> why do I tell you that story? Because... So often when we just pray for small things, it encourages us in the bigger things. If we can get used to praying and seeing God move uh, in in our lives, it encourages our faith. Okay, so that's where we were uh, last week. Um, uh, And uh, just a review of what we talked about at home groups. But then also last week we talked about giving thanks in all things. President Abraham Lincoln, who inaugurated the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States to remind people to be thankful to God. He was conscious that the Americans were getting full of themselves and thought to themselves that their successes, the the very fact that they had grown crops and that they were being successful and that they were being good at business was all down to their own uh, initiative and their own uh, uh, abilities. And he put the Thanksgiving holiday in place to remind them, the Americans, that everything that they had is from God. Even their successes. And to to remind them that, yes, they may have worked hard, but it was God that gave them the strength to work hard. The Old Testament is full of admonitions for the people not to forget God. When you come into the promised land and settle down in your warm homes and you've plenty to eat, don't forget me. I led you out of the wilderness and brought you into the land flowing with milk and honey. And then Psalm 100 is a good psalm. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. And we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Just reminding us again that everything that we have comes from him. And we should be grateful. We should be thankful people. When we realise that everything comes from him, when we need something, it's not difficult to ask him for it. 
If we think that everything comes from our own ability and we look to, to look at our finances and see that we've got nothing and then we say, what can I do? Well, you can do nothing particularly but trust God and listen to what he would want you to do. Yeah, and, and, and again, we are so unthankful. Listen to the conversation of people that you meet this week and you're, I can guarantee you that some of the things that they'll say will be ungrateful. You know, this week it's been, it's too hot. Well, last week it was too cold, too wet, too dry. You know. Oh, just be thankful for what we have. And I was talking with somebody uh, in the cafe uh, um, I, I, to, to, I'm confessing now that I joined in with the moans and groans because we were complaining about the NHS complaining about how I'd taken somebody across to Calderdale and when we got across there we found that when we got to the counter that their appointment had been cancelled and to find out that that appointment had been cancelled the afternoon previously and they said well why didn't you tell us we did tell you we've sent you a letter well that letter ended up on that person's doorstep five days later. So we were going through all the moans and groans about how long it had taken to see so-and-so and and how long it takes to see a consultant, how long it takes to see your doctor out. And then I was reminded about something that Nathaniel had said a couple of weeks previously at the the home group about how his nephew in in Zimbabwe had a problem with his eye and it was a choice between whether he was going to go blind or whether his family were going to go without food for a month because it was going to cost 150 US dollars to have surgery. The family paid for, for his surgery. I understand that the, that person's eyesight isn't, isn't quite right at the moment, and perhaps as a church we can do something for him. But, you know, let's be thankful rather than groan and moan. We need to remember that everything that we have comes from God, the food on our table. There's a story that Harry Ironside tells about a time when he went out for dinner with uh, a non-Christian and as, he, uh, as the dinner was delivered in the restaurant before he, he, he ate it, he, he bowed his head like this to, to pray, to thank God for it. And the chap who he was with says, oh, is there something wrong? Have you got a headache or something? And he says, oh, no, I'm just praying. I'm just thanking God for the food, for the provision that set before me and those that have made it. I'm just praising God. And his non-Christian friend, I don't do any of that. I just dive in. And Harry Ironside, without blinking, said, that's what my dog does. (laughs) We need to be thankful. Thank God. And then there's a story of an old country pastor who was always known for having praise on his lips and he was thankful for everything and one Sunday morning as everybody else arrived at the church it was pouring with rain there'd been a great thunderstorm and it was chucking it down everybody arrived arrived soaking wet wet through as they sat in the pews all the rain was dripping on the on the floor and there was a congregation saying, well, Pastor so-and-so, you know, he's always thanking God for something. I bet he can't find anything to thank God for this morning. As they, the rain dripped off their faces. He got up into the pulpit and he says, I thank God. And everybody sat on the edge of their seat thinking what he was going to thank the Lord for. He says, I thank God that it's not like this every week. <laughs> okay so let's just move on tonight to some verses at the end of Ephesians 5 uh, that talk about the husband and wife relationship now I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I appreciate that not all of us uh, might be married and it might not be quite relevant to you but we will not skip over it but we will mention it so that we understand what it really is all about So, um, here it is. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might pre- present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives with, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So these, shall I say, and I'm going to duck later on in case anybody starts, starts throwing your tomatoes. And then, these, these perhaps are some of the most controversial um, verses in the whole of the Bible, or often misunderstood, should I say. Because when we understand what they really mean, then we don't get the people arguing that they're... Uh, uh, um, they're discriminatory and they're anti-women and that Paul is a misogynist and, uh, and everything. Uh, we live in a world where we are encouraged to stand up for our own rights. I've got right to do this. I've got a right to do that. And a lot of people think that this is all about treading on people and oppressing them. But this is not a scripture about wives being oppressed. It's not a scripture about men husbands lording it over their wives when Paul says wives submit to your husbands there's a big problem even not just amongst feminists outside the church but within church circles Christian couples will carefully work their marriage vows to make it clear that their marriage is going to be a joint partnership and that they will have joint authority so what are we to make of these verses Is Paul a misogynist? Is marriage important? I think there is something that we need not to miss. So let's answer some questions. Some have interpreted interpreted this to mean, mistakenly, that the husband is superior to his wife. That the husband is cleverer, can make better decisions, is more intelligent than his wife, men are more wise and uh, women are unable to think and, and so on. This is not what this scripture says. The Greek word from which we get our word submit, uh, the word used for, for wives and husbands, to husbands, is the word that talks about two people who are absolutely equal in God's eyes. Totally equal. Not one more important than the other, not one inferior to the other. It does not mean that God loves the man more than he does, does the woman, or that the wife is less important. But the wife submitting to the husband is God's function for the family and the husband is responsible to God for it. Yes, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor, there is, nor is there male and female, for you are one in Christ. Yes, we are redemptively equal, we are equal, but in God's design we have a different function. Husbands have a different function to their wives. It doesn't mean to say that they are more important. It's just God's way. So, for example, here I am as the pastor. Now, Scripture says that that you should listen to to what I say. Make my job a lot easier if you listen to me sometimes. and, And that. My position as a pastor, is my function. Does it mean that God loves me anymore? No. Does it mean that I am any more special than you are? No. I, God loves me as much as he does you. He loves you as much as he does me. But within God's design, we have a different function. Just as like Gal plays the worship, other people might do the coffee and tea, other people might do the welcoming, other people might do other things within the church uh, uh, order of things. Does it mean to say that Gal is more important than anybody else, that the worship, that the welcomers are more important? No, it's just the function. Now, if you're still having trouble... Think about Jesus. Now, you might think that this is a bit complicated, but just follow me through. Is the Father God? Yes. 
Is Jesus God? Yes. Are they equal? Yes. The Father is fully God. Jesus is fully God. Did, did Jesus submit to the Father's will? Yes. Was it because he was less important than God? Was it because he wasn't God? No, it was because as the son, he had a different function to fulfill. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. He was equal to God, but he had a function to fulfill and therefore he submitted. In God's design... Wives submit to their husband. Are they less important? No. They are equal in God's eyes, but they have a different function. Or again, you can think about Jesus uh, obeying his, his parents. You know, when Jesus obeyed, Ma obeyed Mary and Joseph, Jesus, technically, he could have said, what do you know about being a parent? I know it all. Don't tell me what to do. I'll tell you what to do. You know, he was a bit, he could have been a child who said he knows more than, he, than his parents know. You know, a bit like today. <laughs> and in this case, it would have been true. But did he submit? Yes, he did. Why did he submit? Not because he was less important, not because he was inferior, but because that was his function that the father had sent him to fulfill. So the first thing that we need to say is that submission is not about inequality, it's about difference in function. But then also, this has often been misunderstood because this verse uh, uh, is often used as a justification for men to lord over their wives. Right, okay, you do as I tell you to do. You must do this and you must do it now and you must be obedient because the Bible says so. Do as you're told. An ill-mannered man was reading a book on being self-assertive and he decided to start at home. So he stormed into his house, pointed a finger at his wife and said, from now on I'm boss around here and my word is law. I want you to prepare me a gourmet meal and run me a bath. Then when I finish the bath... Guess who's going to dress me and comb my hair? The funeral director, said his wife. Think about it. <laughs> but then what is often overlooked is verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So what Paul was not was, was doing here, he was not oppressing women, putting them down. He was lifting them up and giving them a place of dignity which they did not have at that time. He was saying, husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church, which is a pretty tall order, by the way, which we'll come to in a moment or uh, two, which can only be done when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, putting that into context. Because at the time, in Jewish culture, a woman was not treated as a person but as a thing and was owned by her husband in exactly the same way as he owned sheep and goats. She was absolutely her husband's possession to do with as he willed. On no account could the wife leave the husband, although the husband could dismiss the wife at any moment. And some of the liberal labris had it in their, in their laws and in their, in their books about the reasons why you could divorce your wife or tell her to get lost. And one of them was if they put too much salt in your dinner. And so in, in, in those days, literally in, in the Jewish culture of the day, women were treated as a possession, like their sheep and goats, and if, if you got fed up with, one, with them one day because they burnt your toast and didn't make you 
meal right, put too much sugar in your cup of tea, didn't make your tea strong enough or, we, or, or, or made it uh, or, or weak enough or, or whatever, didn't smile at you in the right way, well, bye-bye wife. I'm getting somebody else. So Paul here is elevating the position of the wife and saying to the husband, hey, don't treat your wives like this for goodness sake. Don't treat her as a sack of potatoes and something that you can just get rid of. Love her as Christ loved the church. Wow. That was Jewish culture. Greek culture said that a woman was to remain indoors and be obedient to her husband. It was the sign of a good woman that she must be seen as little uh, and ask as little and uh, as possible. Be seen and not heard. She had no uh, independent existence and no kind of mind of her own. Her husband could divorce her almost at a whim so long as he returned the dowry. So again, get rid of her as, po- as quick as possible. But then look at what and you need to understand. Prostitution was an essential part of Greek life. Uh, Demosthenes uh, had laid down it as the accepted rule of life. We have courtesans for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. We have the wives for the purpose of having children. That's what it was in, in, in Greek culture. If you wanted a good time, you went and had the company of the women in the, in the, in, in, in the courts. If you wanted to satisfy your sexual desires, you just found a prostitute. The only reason why you had a wife back there somewhere (coughs) was so that she could bring your children up. Paul comes in and says, don't treat your wives like this. Love her as Christ loved the church. But then again, in Roman culture, the law provided no rights for a woman woman in law. She remained forever a child. Jerome declares it true that in Rome there was a woman who was, uh, oh yes, um, people just divorced their wives every week, every, every year. And the Romans did not commonly date their years by numbers they named the years by the names of their previous wives. So they didn't say, oh, oh, I remember back in 1986 I bought this car, or back in 1995 I bought this car, and back in 1997 I had this car. It was, oh, it was when Sally was my wife I had this car. It was when Paul was my wife that I did this job. And so on and so on. They named the years by the wives that they had at the time. Paul says, don't change your wife every five minutes. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's a command, not an option. It's not a sexual love. It's not, it's, it's not, it, Paul could have chosen a number of words to describe the love that he was to have for his wife. It's not a, a sexual love, uh, the eros love, which by the way is, is, is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. It's not the philios love, the brotherly love. It is the agape kind of love. It's with God's kind of love that the man is to love his wife. I'm going to conclude now and bring it back so that we can all take something home. So remember here that Paul is not saying it's all about inequality, it's about the man being more important. No, 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 no. It's not about inequality, it's about difference in function. It's not about lordship over and oppressing somebody, but it's about lifting her up and treating her with dignity, rightfully. And Christ loves the church. So how does Christ love the church? How does Christ love you? We can all take this home. In an unselfish, unconditional love. 
It is not affection responding to affection. It's not, well, I could love my wife if she would love me. If she would show me a little more attention, I could love her back. Your wife does not have to do anything for you to love her. She might, well, she doesn't deserve to be loved. We don't deserve to be loved. But Christ loved us. Hallelujah. Romans 5.8 says this, but think about this, while we were wasting our lives in sin, God revealed his powerful love to us in a tangible display. The anointed one died for us. A sacrificial love. Greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. God gave his life, Jesus gave his life, so that you might have life in all its fullness. Thank you, Jesus that you were willing to pay the price so that I might have a relationship with you. Pay the price for my sin. What does the husband do? Sacrificially loves his wife. Gives himself for her. Well, this is going to cost me money. This is going to cost me time. This is going to cost me effort. This is going to cost me... Aren't you thankful that when Jesus went to the cross for you, he didn't say, this is going to cost too much. I'm not sure that I, I want to go this far. Thank you, Lord, that you did not hesitate to give your fullness, your full life to us. It's unlikely that any of us are going to have to literally die for our wives but we are going to have to sacrifice our own desires, our needs for their well-being. You're not going to demand your perfect meals, your perfect toast, and if it's too salty or burnt, file for divorce. You're not going to make the relationship all about you, but all about your spouse. Christ's love was a sanctifying love. Ephesians 5.26 says this, that he might sanctify her, by having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. What can we draw? What parallel can we draw? Well, we can say that sanctify means to set apart, to put in a class all by itself, to make special by making pure and holy. A husband will protect his wife from defilement. He will see the marriage as precious and will not allow anything to dirty that relationship. I'm going to conclude with this scripture now then. So husbands also ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own body, his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Aren't you thankful that God nourishes and cherishes you? You are special to him. When you cherish somebody, you sort of hug them and you keep them warmth. You show them the warmth of your love. When you nourish them, you, you, you help them to grow and be the person that God wanted them to be. That's what Christ does for us. So husbands are to do the same for their wives. Now, I know that the husband-wife relationship isn't all relevant for us all, but I hope tonight that you've recognised, if nothing else, that God loves you with an unconditional love, that God loves you with a sacrificial love. God lo loves you with a, a love that nourishes you and cherishes you because you are important. You are special to him. Husbands, let's make sure that we love our wives as Christ loved the church and demonstrate to the world how much Christ loves the church. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus, for Paul's word. And Father, I pray that even if I have not explained adequately the scripture this evening, Father, that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand that it's not about inequality, but about difference in function. It's about being redemptively equal, but having different parts to play in your design. Father, help us to see that it's not about men taking advantage of women or oppressing women, but they have a big job. 
to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And Father, in our own strength, we cannot do that. We need your Holy Spirit to help us. That's why Paul wrote earlier on in, this, in that chapter, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Lord, may we not struggle on our own, but look to you to help us to fulfill what that you've, you've called us to do so that our marriages can be a picture of your love for the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you, girl. One last song. Hallelujah. Well, I can see we're going to have some good discussions at home groups, aren't we? In the cafe groups in a few weeks' time. That, uh, they are not this week. Next home groups are on Tuesday the 28th and Thursday the 30th of June. Make sure you join us next week because next week we talk about whether we should obey our husbands if they are not Christians and in what circumstances do we not submit to them. 
we're going to put it in the context of um, uh, workers obeying their bosses and children obeying, obeying their parents. It's all good stuff. I'm sure we're going to be encouraged. I'm sure we're going to be blessed. Don't forget to take home that God loves you unconditionally. His love for you is sacrificial and he nourishes and cherishes you. Oh, thank you, Lord. When we get a grasp of what Jesus has done for us, it makes us husbands find it easier to love our wives. Amen. God bless you. If you want to call me, 747 277 uh, My telephone number at home is 01484323978. Email me at info at hvelim.org. UK. And don't forget that we love you, God loves you, and that we are blessed. Amen. Blessed by the best. See you next week. Bye for now.